Hey, hey, Blue Table fans. Oh, yeah. No glasses. All right. Shark Eyes here. Ready to tell you how it is. So listen, things are going great at Blue Table Painting. And it makes me happy and peaceful inside my heart. So I've got a client named Luke. Thank you, Luke. And he sends me a, a missive, a question, really. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you. So blah, 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 Thunderhawk. Uh, let's see. Hold on a second. Oh, okay. So, uh, oh boy, I really should have read this beforehand. No, it's okay. I would like to see a video featuring my entire Deathwing force from a collector's point of view. I'm seriously debating ensuring my collection against hurricanes. How would you appraise them? Plus, any advice on the process? I think several other viewers would be interested. Could you emphasize things that bring value to a collection? Paint job customizations, having the named characters. Does uh, He's commissioning a Thunderhawk, so does the Thunderhawk actually bring value or would everything just be parceled out? Please point out things that detract from collections. I've dropped a few of them while playing games. Is it better not to paint my guys? Does the carrying case influence the value? Can customizations actually hurt, and do people care about made-up banner, banners and lore? Finally, you could talk about some simple things people could do to easily increase the value of their collections. Maybe get popular, diverse units, magnetizing weapons, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I got a lot to say about this. <clears throat> yeah, this, uh, this could be a while. So, first off, in the miniatures, painting, and assembly business, this is custom work, so the, the, the values aren't the, the secondary market is like bargain basement typically, and customizations, uh, they cost a lot. It takes a lot of effort to get things done up from scratch. I mean, even just assembling a force is like this huge uh, undertaking to assemble an army. And, and do it and do it right. Do it with quality, attention to detail, and so forth. So there's, uh, yeah, guys, it's wild, wild west. Still, I don't think the wargaming industry, in terms of what happens after they're manufactured, has found equilibrium. Like you go to a convention and you might see all these arm painted armies on the table. But, and you think of it as one thing, like, oh, there's only one thing going here. People are playing this game. But there's not. There's actually several things going on. The first off is the manufacture of the sprues. And that's what you get. Like, up to that point where you purchase the box full of unfinished, unassembled product, that's a whole manufacturing step right there. That's like, and that's the industry that a lot of these companies are in. They're into the part where they just make the miniatures and then, oh, oh well, whatever happens after that, it's up to you. So you've got this thing where originally, like for many decades, it, it was a hobby. Like when you bought those things, you were the one that was going to put them together. And so... What I've been doing since 2003, by the way, for a while, the prime of my life, like the giant heart of Sean Gately's life has been doing this. Of course, that's really not true. I'm 48 and 48 to 60. That's some premium years too, guys. So you end, and that, that this all ties into these questions here. That ties into the value because there's a perception of value. And I think that when you're in an industry where it's like, well, putting these together and painting them, that's fun. People don't evaluate it the same. They don't evaluate it correctly. Like, for example, if you had two guys come work a full-time week just landscaping your yard, how much would you pay them? What would you expect the bill to be? And for anything else, let's say you have, well, plumbing and uh, electricity aren't really good comparisons. I don't know, I can't think of any other good comparisons offhand. Landscaping, that's about the skill level that you need to do basic paint work. And, and it's, it's so, my point is, it's not appraised correctly. Like, 
it's it's undervalued and it's something that like it pains it pains me to see that this industry this profession is not getting the respect and value that it deserves and look on um on facebook of course artistic types tend to seek me out and I make those connections, and I see it in other industries as well. It's like, well, why don't you just draw me up uh, my role-playing character? Why don't you just whip me up a piece of art? It's, it's not considered like, you're not really doing anything, so, you know, people expect it cheap or free. So anyway, so if you're having an army done up, what makes it maintain its value? Oh, awesome. I have so much experience in this area. It, so like on eBay, <laughs> eBay, eBay is nuts, man. Like you go on there and it's like, and you actually, you don't see very many uh, really well-painted whole collections there. Um, and my theory is people are just, they're just kind of holding on to them. The good ones are held on to. So, okay, so some specifics. First off, if you're selling your army, uh, you need to look for what I call poison pills. Poison pills could be the whole army's painted really well, except for these two units. You should drop those units. And in fact, when you're selling the army, don't even sell those units separately. Just completely set them aside as if they had never existed. Get, get, get them out of the public eye. Just sell the core, good, painted, holistic part of the army. Because what happens is, the human mind is a funny thing. So let's say, like a Tau army. So it's like you have this great Tau army. Let's say it's all painted, but you have a unit of Vespids. Now, I don't know, in 8th edition, maybe they're great. But in all the previous editions, they weren't great. So in someone's mind, they'd be like, well, this is a great army, but I really don't want to pay for the Vespids. So that can sort of stick in somebody's mental craw as something where, they, in their mind, they devalue the whole thing. So unpainted models, partially painted models, weird stuff that's like not competitive or not desirable you should just you should get rid of don't, don't try and throw those things be like oh i'll throw in this these bases or whatever no 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 no. just pare it down to something that makes sense <clears throat> all right ah, i'm back did you think i just wandered off uh so yeah and it's like, once an army is painted, it's all done up, it doesn't hold its value. I've had, seriously, like right now, I'd say I've had $40,000 of deadbeat buyers where there was nothing wrong with the work, but for whatever reason, they just couldn't, you know, come through with it. So it's... And that's custom work. And what happens is if it takes... Uh, a certain amount, like as time ticks on with a commission, there's a chance that there will be a landmine of the game changing, or that person being like, well, I don't, I'm not even interested in Grey Knights anymore. So you've got to, if you're going to be in this business, you got to strike while the iron's hot and get those commissions turned around really quick. And uh, that's something Blue Table Painting is, was really famous for, and then I choked for a while, and then, and now we're back on top where the commissions are being turned around in a really uh, expedient fashion. So turnaround time, so the timing affects the value of a commission. But once you get it, not everyone's going to want that army. It, this is custom work. This is a prestige hobby. So the answer is no, armies don't hold their value. And really, you're better off taking the best part of an army selling that as a chunk, waiting until it sells, then putting up your other items. Typically, like on my web store, it's pretty well picked over. And you know why? Because stuff is half off. By the way, bluetablestore.com. Mmm, plug. Uh, because I sell stuff for half off. And you see, you see people, they, like on Facebook, even sites where things are being sold. It's like, hey, I'm selling my Tyranids. It's $1,000 worth of stuff, but you can get them for only $700. No, that's not a great price. That's like the guy at the garage sale that wants 20 bucks for his lamp. You know, I bought it for 30, 20 is a great, no, no, it's not. It's, it's not great. 
that's so typically like when you're talking about just uh, just raw materials not painted up the, so by the way the paint should add value but it doesn't unless it's really 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 good paint so anyway uh, something 20% off that's decent you can kind of just get that like almost anywhere 30% off that's good but to really make something move you got to go to 40 or 50% off 50% off I call it the no-brainer so when you're looking at a painted army to pick up a painted army if you can buy the army for the retail cost of the models and they're painted up even decently that's what I call the no-brainer price because the amount of effort that's put in to it's disproportionate you really should be paying for just a standard infantry figure you should be paying 15 to 20 dollars per figure for the amount of labor that goes into just a tabletop tabletop work to assemble and paint a standard plastic figure that's 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 if the market had equilibrium and it had actual value in it that's what you'd be looking at of course there's meta factors here things that are even higher than what i'm talking about for example games workshop has been around for 30 years they've been cramming plastic into the market this whole time and it's generated a secondary market which competes with their primary market where people go uh well they look and they go oh one guy's like 30 bucks or i can just buy this guy's whole army at you know a reduced rate and oh and it's already done up fantastic and that affects me too because who wants to custom make an army when they can just pick up a painted one on the secondary market uh but that's not necessarily true i'm still uh i'm still cracking on so to speak um let me think here <sighs> so the primaris marines he actually talks about primaris marines Pri that is a stroke of genius i mean just amazing because what they've done is they've taken a huge chunk of everything they've ever sold and they've just sidelined it it's still usable there's nothing wrong with it there's nothing wrong with making something new that kind of makes the old thing not as great uh but oh yeah because the new primaris marines they are shiny and I've talked at length about my view on the Primaris Space Marines. I think they're great. And let's see here. Okay, so in terms of the value of a collection, <sighs> customizations can definitely add to the value of a collection. People will pay for custom for something that for something that's unique. And I think that as long as it's not out on the fringe you know like a hello kitties marines army it's going to take a special buyer to want that but something that's customized boy that val that value can go really up like something has to be really something special for collectors who also have the funds to look at that and go that is something special i want that and so there you go so things tend to either click over to like really valuable very small segment of that or they tend to click over to just being like people expect bargain basement and uh let's see here customizations banners lore yeah it it depends depends how specific that lore is uh magnetizing weapons oh that's huge because let's say you have three Tau battle suits painted up real nice, and every single thing in the kit is magnetized on them. Oh, mm, those guys have staying power. Can I just tell you? Because now, no matter how the game changes, you can still use those figures. Things with fixed options that could would, could be great in one edition, just like that. The new army book comes out. Surprise! New army book. Ah, uh, now those things are obsolete. They're not that great. So it's, it's easy just to fall into the pit of something being not that valuable. Um, competitive versus non-competitive players, that's also a big difference. Competitive players will typically drop a lot of money on their, on their figures. So, all right, well, I think I, I think I, 
answered all these questions. Uh, I do want to make a note about insurance. Okay, so first off, you've got shipping insurance through United States Postal Service. You can't... Okay, I, now I'm just stating my opinion. It's super hard to collect on that. And even if you do, so like let's say they um, <laughs> you ha bought a painting for $5,000 and then you went to say, and you insured it for $5,000 and then you went and let's say they completely blew it. Um, even if it were obvious, it wouldn't matter. They would go, well, we're just going to replace the cost of the frame and the canvas and the physical cost of the paint. That's it. Mi and minimum wage to have somebody repaint it. Like, it's, it's, it's just, it's dumb. And I, I don't know, maybe the Postal Service has changed, but I just get signature confirmation and tracking on packages and make sure everyone's notified of, you know, when it's coming. And that's, that's really the best. So I usually don't recommend insurance, but, you know, it doesn't cost that much. So if you want to get it, then I would get it. Uh, the other thing, and again, my information may be outdated. I haven't had a great experience with, with that. Um, I've probably, well, and that's what I found out early on is that if anything happened to the army, uh, the phone call wouldn't go to the post office. It was going to come to me. Well, why is that? Because I'm going to pick up, and actually do something about it. So, uh, that's that. That's a toughie. But this guy talks about hurricane insurance. So you just talk to your insurance people ahead of time because what happens is, you let's say you pay $3,000 for your army. That's not necessarily... The cost that you paid isn't necessarily the replacement cost. And that's what the insurance agency is going to be looking at. And that's something I can actually help you with because I have all these standardized forms about... Uh, of what it costs to do all these things. And they're not just based out of stuff I just pulled out of my head. It's based on actually years and years and years and years of experience of knowing exactly what is involved to get these jobs done. And yeah, so there you go. Thanks again. I think this video could be fun to make and a lot of people would be super interested. And I went into this not even like having read this recently, so, you know, I just sort of blurted out everything I thought about it, as usual. Um, so final notes, uh, Blue Table Painting has finished well over 7,000 projects. Uh, I'm going to, and I'm going to tell you how I come up with that number. My original website would have, would generate an automatic ID for every album that I created in it. And starting it started at one, album one, and then by the time we replaced that website, it's saved out there somewhere. By the time we replaced that website, it was to 6,500. Now, some of those albums are parent albums. Some of them are multiple albums of, you know, um, the same project, but not many. So I called it, I called it 6,000. And that seemed, those numbers seemed to bear out in my mind with the time that we had been in business. I think at the time it was, we had been up and running for like seven years and, and had many people working for the company, just cranking out armies. Uh, there was a point in time where we were doing on average an army a day. And so if you ever go to Adepticon, imagine Adepticon, Imagine every single army and collection in the entire place, in the entire convention. That's about how much BTP has painted. An insane amount of figures. Like, you, it just boggles the mind. And then, about four years ago, we started using Flickr. And so, we have a Flickr page. And uh, that, I think, is creeping up to somewhere between 1,700 and 2,000. So between all of that, sort of rounding everything down is where I get the number of 7,000. It's probably more like 8,000 projects. And guys, that's a lot. Like, you just don't know what's been involved. It's, it's incredible. And I, I don't think anyone on the planet has done really quite what I've done. I'm not bragging on it. I'm just 
riffing on this thing in terms of what what the industry is all about and so because the industry really is this piranha like swarm of solo artists bubbling into existence and then just popping like <laughs> the the internet is just littered with hundreds probably thousands of defunct solo painter efforts and because it's really easy to plant your brush and say hey i'm doing this for a living i'm doing this on the side but it's an entirely different thing to develop an extensive portfolio to really stick with it to be productive year after year after year after year and not give up because it's back to value of figures is it can be it can be it can be pretty depressing well anyone that's in art understands understands this man if you could see how exactly i folded this jeez ocd just kicks in and i don't realize it so it's um it's it's quite a world and right now Last I counted, a couple weeks back, we were sitting on 47 projects. I'd like it to be about 30. 30 would be that real tight turnaround that I'm working at. Uh, right now, it's just a good turnaround. And, <clears throat> uh, yeah, geez. Mm, I, I got right around 10 artists going. And um, it's, it's real nice. I got to tell you guys. I've been in Salt Lake for two years now, and it's and I have peace. It's amazing. I was standing in the storeroom with my assistant just looking at what was back there, the projects that are waiting to get picked up, which is not it was like five or six projects, you know. And right and, and that that's how that's how that's how I do a quick thumbnail of things. I look at the list, I just count up the total project, 47 projects, count up the artists, like okay, 10 artists. And, you know, about how many projects a week does an artist do? And, um, <clears throat> and then I look at pre-op and op and post-op. Now, post-op means it's done and the project's just getting pictures and being billed. And uh, right now, it's four, the, when I count it, it's 47. We only had 12 projects in pre-op where we were uh, just waiting for models. And a lot of those were just models being you know, projects where the client was sending them in and we just hadn't got them yet. And wow! Oh, thank you! It feels, it feels amazing. It feels peaceful. I feel peaceful. I feel restful. And my personal life is really amazing. And I've actually been able to turn to uh, some other things that are interesting to me without... Um, Without losing sight, I'm checking the time here. By the way, 23 minutes. Jeez, I I can just go. And it, it's um, uh, you know, without letting keep taking my hands off the wheel for the main operation, because when people send me their models, well, that's a responsibility. I got to get those projects done. And um, huh, 14 years, man, you guys. You guys have no idea what I've been through. It's <laughs> it's incredible. Um, maybe I should make this a different video. No, I'll just make it part of this. Just to, as a personal note, I believe that, and this is just me, not a preachment, it's uh, that what's going on inside projects out into life, into my experience. So when I'm, I'm experiencing something that maybe seems unpleasant or unwanted or unexpected, I go, well, what's going on in me that's sort of bringing this about? And it's a great sort of, uh, uh, what's that called? It sort of uh, produces introspection where I'm like, okay, what, what's going on? In, how can I change up what's going on inside of me and how I look at the world and how I'm responding to people and interacting with people that can make this, make this different? And it's almost like tuning, tuning a radio dial. It's like, well, yeah, oh, I really don't like this station. This station's a word. This music is da-da-da. It's like, well, you'd look at that person like they were insane. You'd be like, well, change it. Change your station and get something different. Turn the knob and get something different. And uh, to my way of viewing things, the knob is inside. 
change your terrible attitude, maybe get something different. Smile and the whole world smiles with you. And <clears throat> that is that is that is my words to to live by. And of course, you know, I don't think I'm there yet. I go through the day and I kind of I'm kind of grousing about things and then it's like, "Oh, well, maybe if I just switched up my terrible attitude, things would things would work out better." And that's true. That and and it's and things have worked out better. It's uh, you know, I put my money where my mouth is, so to speak. And it's uh my life, my life is very peaceful right now. Right now I'm working on a terrain project for Valhalla. I've, I'm two days behind schedule because I've just kind of blown up my days, not worrying about it too much. Um, and uh, I, I, still, I still think I can get everything done. It's one of those things where I just keep adding, I keep making my life harder by adding things to it. When it's like, no, Sean, you just need just do two levels of the tower and call that, call that a good day. You know, and I think... Yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. I think at this point I can't lose just with what I've with what I've made. This is in reference to ultimate ultimate D and D. I've been very very excited about that, and things have been really progressing in uh, in a natural and sort of miraculous, easy doors opening sort of sort of way. And we'll see we'll see how that goes. All right. Well, anyway, well, Luke, I hope I answered your question. Uh, send me an email. One thing I've noticed is that comments on YouTube, well, I've, I've told you how I feel about this. I've disabled the comments on almost all of my videos now. Every once in a while I open up and then, you know, like I get five or ten people. It's, ne it's never like it used to be. Uh, we're in an age now where it's like anytime you put something out there, like any anybody can be published now. And when you put something out there, there's an implicit sort of request for everybody's opinion. And I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe that's not, maybe the opinion wasn't really wanted, you know. And the thing is, and I've noticed, people won't email me directly about stuff. They'll say it in public, and I'm like, huh, I wonder what the mechanics behind that is. Well, it's attention, of course, to, it's not really an interaction between me and the person. So what I'm saying is, if you want a meaningful interaction, look me up on Skype. Look blue table painting and look me up at on my email blue table painting at gmail.com and uh, you know I will probably respond in some kind of way. Uh, well, I guess that's uh, that's about it. So thanks for tuning in and I hope you got your information for the day. <laughs>